What was Venice Beach before? I'm not going to speak as poet laureate, I'm actually going to speak as a native person. And um, I have a wild thought that history and philosophy didn't start with Europeans who came here. And um, to me it's important to point out how complex the peoples were in this land already. Amazing, wondrous architecture they created beautiful cities, orderly and clean, as well as communal relationships in tribal villages as well as nomadic people. Not just architecture, but medicine that they helped find, the plants, the also the astronomical and mathematical geniuses that they were. I can go on and on. There were so many beautiful, bountiful things that they brought to this world. And this is why I think it's really important that we respect and honor this is Mitch O'Farrell, an LA City Councilman, also an enrolled member of the Wyandotte Nation, who announced that the LA will now be uh, replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, LA County, as you know, did the same thing. City of San Fernando did it. In fact, there are half a dozen states that now have declared uh, Indigenous Peoples Day or Native American Day. And uh, cities from Seattle to Salt Lake City have now declared this. It's a movement. But I think what's important about this movement is that what it's trying to say about indigenous peoples is a little bit more deeper because I think it's also trying to point out that the contributions of indigenous peoples is still with us today. Not just in the words we speak, not just in the food we eat, not just in some of our even innate philosophies, but they're with us in such ways that I think they become vital, these ideas, these philosophies, this way of thinking. Indigenous people are also very big in the state of California. As you might not be aware, the state of California had more native peoples than any other state in the country. So one of the things we're gonna remember about Indigenous Peoples Day is not just the contributions and the great history that they've had, but also the horrendous treatment that they've been under since Europeans have been in this continent. There was an estimated million people that were here in California when the Spanish first began to explore the state in the 1500s. By the time they settled in the 1700s, they created the mission systems, which in California, if you study, they always extol it as a beautiful, wonderful thing. People don't know that enslavement and elimination of natives was part of that system. 86% of the native people that were in the missions died. And then as you know, uh, the US invaded Mexico and in 1848 at the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, they pretty much controlled California. But the worst was yet to come. A year later, gold was discovered in the Sierras. California with the US began to create bonds that were voted on by jurisdictions, cities, counties, as well as the state, to pay bounties to kill off Native Americans. In fact, in 1852, California legislature paid more than a million dollars for militias to kill off Native people. Some of the payments were as crazy as $5 for a head, 25 cents for a scalp. By the year 1900, there were only 16,000 Native Americans still in the state. That's not counting the Mexican, Sonoran, and other tribes over here, talking about the ones from the state. That is a genocide. And this state, beautiful, wonderful, golden state, has played a terrible role in that. And this is why it's important to remember Indigenous Peoples Day and use that day to bring this into account. I have roots with the Raramari people of Chihuahua, Mexico. They're also known as the Tarumaras. They're considered some of the fastest runners in the world. I think only Kenyans have proved to be faster. They are in the southern part of Chihuahua in the Copper Canyon, uh, where my mother's family came from. And uh, they are the second largest indigenous tribe 
uh, north of Mexico City out to the Navajo. They are also linguistically and culturally tied to U.S. tribes like the Hopi, the Paiute, Shoshone, Pueblo, but also tribes in California like the Shumash, the Tangwa, the Tavium. We are all family. A border came and now we're separated. Now we're not together anymore. There are four deserts that go across the U.S. and Mexico. The Great Basin, Mojave, um, the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts. My mother, when she had me born, walked across the International Bridge from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico to El Paso, Texas. We were going from our land to our land. And that's why I don't consider myself an immigrant, because some of these tribes have been here upwards of 60,000 years. And I am connected to that. And I consider these tribes here my family. Lost, perhaps, put aside, but it's important to recognize how connected we are. I also want to bring in what I think is important is the deep separations and alienations that Native peoples have had, but I think all of us have had. Because what's happened in an advanced capitalist civilization, we get alienated from our own creativity, we get alienated from the labor, the products of our labor, we get alienated from our roots, from our history, we get alienated from each other. We are constantly separated, constantly. Native peoples in particular have paid a big price, as you know, because they were forced to assimilate, they were forced to give up their teachings, they were forced to give up their ancestral knowledge, they were forced to give up the land. So, but we all pay a price for it. And so what I would like to propose is that we try to see a way that Native philosophy and thinking guide us into the present and the future of this country. I had a, um, a nice ex-Marine come and talk to me uh, and wanted to really convince me how important the U.S. Constitution was and how the U.S. Constitution, being the supreme law of the land, was the best thing going. And of course, I think it's got a lot of good things. <laughs> I'm not against the U.S. Constitution, but I had to tell him, for Native peoples, it was a limited warranty. It actually curtailed the rights and freedoms that people already had on this land. Native peoples knew that as long as they followed the laws and rhythms of nature, they could be free to do almost anything. Appreciation of necessity was the way they worked. What you needed to do allowed you to do anything. The U.S. Constitution, it is the supreme law of the land, curtailed the rights of African Americans, women, Native Americans. It was actually mostly used for white men of property. Now, we have fought many battles, court cases, street battles. Native peoples, like all kinds of peoples, have fought in wars. So the Constitution has now brought in more people. Women got the, finally the chance to vote just last century. African American, the civil rights, gay community, barely now being recognized. Native Americans were not considered citizens until 1924. Barely now, we're getting part of those freedoms. But I think that especially as we're looking at what kind of world that we're entering, a world that to me is very uncertain, a world that has an economic base that is actually widening the gap between the poorest and the richest, a world in which our politics is almost a joke. And I'm talking about Democrat or Republican. I'm talking about liberal or conservative. We're all caught in the wrong web. And we feel it. And we know that our voices don't get heard and our votes don't get seen. And we know that it's not working for us. And I really do think that instead of just going back 230 years, let's go back deeper and further. Because there were people in this land that knew how to live, how to think, how to connect. And so what I want to share with you, at least from the philosophy of indigenous people, four key connections that I think are important for people. First of all, the big four key connections to honor, respect, and align with. And one is to connect with yourself. What do I mean by that? I mean every human being has particular and specific attributes, propensities, geniuses, gifts. We don't always connect to that. Most of us are not taught that we have something to do in this world, that we have something to give in this world that we have a destiny. Native peoples understood destiny. Among the Nahuatl-speaking peoples, it's called Tonali. 
And Tolaris also has a greeter day. Guali Tonali means have a good day, which also means have a good destiny. And that's just a recognition that everyone has one. And we need to connect with ourselves again. What are your gifts? What are you giving to the world? What were you meant to do? That, to me, is what's very vital and missing in our culture and will guide us in many, many ways to what we need to do. Another connection is to connect with others. And one of the best ways to present this is the way Jesus presented it in the Bible. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Treat others as you want to be treated. The golden rule. It's really the central philosophy to how to connect with others. That we all can find our commonality. Yes, we have different belief systems, different languages, different cultures, different foods. We have so many things that makes us different, maybe different politics. But underneath, we have a deep commonality that says we're all one big family, human beings. And unfortunately, because we live in a society that's created illusions uh, that we live by, we think those illusions are the real things. Mortgages, borders, all made up, wage systems. Uh, we I can run all down to you all these illusions that we spend our lives on people, stock markets, people will d jump off buildings when the stock goes down. They'll kill themselves for these illusions when all, all the time we were connected as humanity, a commonality that we all have. We all have loss. We all have heartbreak. We all have love. We all have the mother-child relationship. We all have so many other things that bring us together that we forget. And all we look at each other and we see different, different, different. And we can't even agree. But even if we disagree, which is fine, we can't even get together with the people we disagree with. So that's a very important connection that has to be made. Another very important one is connect with nature. We have lost our connection to nature. Native peoples knew that nature was their greatest university. Nature teaches you both the bad and good things of life and what you need to do. It teaches you that, for example, there are poisonous mushrooms just like they're beautiful, healthy mushrooms. And sometimes the poisonous ones look a lot better and prettier than the, the non-poisonous ones, which teaches you about not getting taken up by the lure of things. You know what I'm saying? That all of it teaches you. I'm just giving you one example of ways that nature can help you understand. Nature works in certain ways. It's got an actual um, language, which is mathematics, and you understand mathematics enough, you understand how nature speaks to us and how we can learn from it, how nature, in fact, is an abundance. Its key element is abundance, but society, it's scarcity, you understand? Our society is not aligned to nature. Scarcity is made up, it's manufactured. We live at it, we look, you know, we can't do this, we can't do that. We, uh, if we get a job, we, we're gonna destroy the climate because we can't do both. That's scarcity. You gotta build a wall because you can't get a job when Mexicans coming over and, and other people can't work, that's scarcity. You understand how it works. We hate each other because now we don't got the resources enough for everybody. And yet nature teaches you how to be abundant, how to make those resources work for everybody. And again, this is an important part that's missing, and we got to connect to it again. There are actual laws that allow us to be in that place of plentitude and abundance that nature can give us. And the next one is connect with the divine. And I understand that people have created amazing religions and belief systems trying to do this, and I'm not against any of that. But even if you don't have a belief system, and even if you think, I don't have a connection with the divine, it's still a necessary point that somehow you be spiritually engaged, that somehow that you can find the internal in the temporal, that you can find the transcendent in the imminent, that you can find how to access energies beyond just the material ones in the world that we see. You understand? And even if you don't believe in a God or you don't believe in, in deity, there's spirit in art, there's spirit in music, there's spirit in dance, there's spirit coming every way we turn. And it's kind of like trying to find a way to connect to it, like get a plug right into the AC, DC, you get your electricity, but somehow you gotta find a way to connect to that spirit, to that other world beyond the world that you see. And sometimes an artistic and spiritual practices allow you to do it. That's what allows you to try to connect. So it's very important to me that we have a connection to the divine and not leave it out of any equation that we do with people. So I'm gonna leave you with this beautiful thought 
Change is not about doing things differently. Aligning with these four key connections is what makes real change possible. In other words, alignment is what Native peoples have been teaching people always. Being out of balance, we know, we see it in relationships with our kids, uh, in politics, the imbalance is palpable. We all are not in balance with our food, the way we eat, our health. And um, one thing you should know that the Raramari or the Tarumara, when they're traditional, my mother's tribe, they're some of the healthiest people in the world. They don't eat meat, even though the Spanish brought the, Sp the goats and the hogs and the other animals. They only use those animals to fertilize the field. They still try to do the three sisters, the corn, squash, and beans, that together create a beautiful garden of food. They walk for hours. They run. They are so healthy. But unfortunately, as soon as they leave the traditional lands, as soon as they become civilized, and they go into the ghettos of Chihuahua City where my mother was born, they become diabetic, they become alcoholics, they start beating their wives and kids, which they don't do in traditional. They're lost and confused. And I was there in that ghetto, La Taromara, they call it. People pulled guns on me. They're beautiful people, and it doesn't take very much for them to lose their deepness. What they've been is this misaligned. They're not aligned anymore. And many of us have also lost that because to me, everybody has an indigenous root. You understand? It's the most radical root of anybody, no matter where they come from, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, from all over the world, the most radical root is the indigenous. And if you can get back to that root, you will get to the things that we're talking about that connect to the tribal peoples in this land and make this a beautiful place for everybody. And I just end with one last saying in the language of the Raramari, Guirava. Greet of us, how people greet each other, and also how they say goodbye. It's like aloha in Hawaii. But greet of us means something. We are one. Please remember, with all the differences, we are one. We have one destiny. We have one community. We are one family, one humanity. Thank you all very much.